Howdy everybody, Dr. Andy Woods here. Welcome to Pastor's Point of View number 220. Today is July 22nd, 2022. I'm back with my friend, colleague, fellow elder, associate pastor, Dr. Jim McGowan, and I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugarland Bible Church. And we are bringing you today, uh, here on Pastor's Point of View, uh, a prophecy update. You'll notice our outline here, and here's the four areas that we're going to go through. And we've got some really, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I would consider it groundbreaking information to report to you today. So fasten your seatbelts, folks. It's going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride. Uh, we're about to, as the pilot would say, we're about to encounter some turbulence. Yes. Okay. So let's start here <clears throat> with Israel. And of course, we know prophetically that the agenda of the nations is to divide Israel in the last days. Yes. First to come against Israel and then to divide it. Israel in general, the city of Jerusalem in particular. Here's some verses that demonstrate that prophetically. We've quoted them many times, but can you help us with those verses? First, Zechariah 12, verse 3. All right, reading from the New American Standard 95 Update, Zechariah 12.3. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. So all against Jerusalem. All. Uh, a couple of chapters later in Zechariah's prophecies, he says the same thing, Zechariah 14.3. Why don't you just read just verse 2, if you don't mind. All right, coming from Zechariah 14, verse 2. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. All nations, all nations. goyim in Hebrew, against Jerusalem. And then you have this prophecy in, in Joel, it's a description, really, of why God is going to enter his judgment against yeah. the nations in the last days. And what does it say there? Joel 3, verse 2. Joel 3, 2. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. So God is upset. That the nations have divided his land, yes. the land of Israel. And see, I guess what I'm we're trying to communicate here is America is fitting into that pattern. Right. Where the current administration has ambitions, I believe, to buy into the Palestinian narrative, yes. which is a divided Jerusalem yeah. and a divided land of Israel. And that's prophetically significant. Because Zechariah twice and Joel once says that's the direction the world will move in yeah. as we get closer to the return of Christ. So it's interesting. I have this mm. article from Israel Today by Israel Today staff, July 17th, 2022. And it deals with Biden's most recent uh, trip to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And he actually went into East Jerusalem and he did something very interesting when he went there. The title of the article yeah. says Biden removed Israeli yeah. flag Wow! <laughs> during East Jerusalem visit. Israeli officials decry implicit assault on sovereignty over the eastern half of the capital, which was recognized by mm -hmm. Trump. So he's undoing the Trump policy that yeah. once uh, again. Israel is once again, that Israel mm -hmm. is undivided. So we just have a couple of um, underlined portions there from that article. And what does that say? Jerusalem is still on the negotiating table. Today's pictures of Biden's limousine highlights the message he is trying to send, that the sovereignty of Jerusalem, Israel's eternal capital, is on the table for negotiation. So he's basically buying into the Palestinian narrative. It's oh, basically yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. And here's a screenshot from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, it says Biden's entourage removed the Israeli flag from his car mm. during his visit to East Jerusalem, a move that may be seen as undermining Israeli sovereignty. Here's mm. another screenshot from Senator 
Bill Haggerty, Haggerty of Tennessee. And what does he say in his tweet? He says, uh, while official U.S. policy recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital, uh, the President of the United States visited East Jerusalem and removed Israel's flag from his official limo, a signal of division undermining Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. This is not how we should treat Israel ever. So when he goes into Jerusalem, he takes down the Israeli flag from mm-hmm. his, his limousine. And yeah. people say, oh, come on, it's just a flag. No What's big, a big deal. deal? Mm-hmm. But what you have to understand is in the Middle East, symbol is reality. Yes, yes. <laughs> it may not be that way here in America. The way We don't think the same way they do in the Middle East. But in the Middle East, that means everything. Mm-hmm. And so he's telegraphing his intentions that part of Jerusalem really does not belong to the Jewish people. Exactly right. And uh, he's buying into the Palestinian narrative by doing this, that Jerusalem is really a divided city. Now, we have a QR code. You can um, put your camera up to the screen and track this easy. Uh, We're going to do that several times in this show. But pastor's point of view, number 216 we talked about how Biden is already laying the infrastructure in place to eventually move our capital away from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv. And we also have another code leading to pastor's point of view, number 219, which was the show that we did just prior to this one last week. And in that particular show, essentially we were talking about how a lot of more conservative-based politicians were concerned about Biden going to Jerusalem mm-hmm. uh, to visit, what does it say here, Augusta Victoria Hospital on the Mount of Olives. So he intentionally designed his trip in a way where he would go to East Jerusalem right, to satisfy the Palestinian narrative. Mm-hmm. Then, as he's going into East Jerusalem, he takes the Israeli flag off his car, and he's already put into place the infrastructure, as we recorded in Pastor's Point of View, 216, to eventually move the capital from Jerusalem back to embassy to Mm -hmm. completely undo what Trump did. Right. Um, And so we believe that the United States of America, as we speak, is actually fitting into a prophetic pattern. Right where all the nations, that would include the late great USA, are coming against Israel uh, and Jerusalem in the last days. Yeah. And sort of to dovetail on that, we have this article here from Israeli National News. June the 17th, 2022, and it says Saudi Arabia conditions normalization with Israel on two-state solution. Saudi Arabia's foreign minister says, we have made it clear that peace comes at the end of the of Arab peace initiative process. And so this deals with these things that have been put into place called the Abraham Accords. Yes. Which are basically normalization agreements between the nation of Israel and Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. These are really not peace agreements because they're made with nations that were not at war with Israel. Right. But they're basically these normalization agreements where the agreement is Israel says we'll open up trade, Mm -hmm. tourism, technology, et cetera, to your country, and all you have to do is recognize that we exist as a nation. Right. And the way these have been explained to me is these are innocuous, these are harmless, Um, this is just opening up normalization between two countries that really were never at war with each other. And I pretty much believed what everybody was telling me about these, that these are innocuous. Mm -hmm. But the next nation to fall under the auspices of the Abraham Accords that most analysts agree is the next nation is Saudi Arabia. Right. And here's Saudi Arabia saying, we're not going to enter into an uh, Abraham Accords unless Israel is divided. Right. And that's what they mean by the two state solution. Yes. In other words, the so-called West bank, which is really Judea and Samaria, 
don't belong to the Jewish people. Um, we're going to make that some kind of international zone or, or something. And essentially what Saudi Arabia is doing, according to this article, is it's using the Abraham Accords to kind of put their nose under the tent mm. to divide the nation of Israel. Right. So actually these Abraham Accords, if this article is accurate, are far more harmful mm -hmm. than what we've been led to believe. Yeah. And so to help us a little bit with that article, if you could. All right. Saudi Arabia will not agree to fully normalize relations with Israel unless a two-state solution is implemented. Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, Adel al-Juber, told CNN on Saturday, quoting now, regarding Israel-Palestinian issues, the two sides underscored their enduring commitment to a two-state solution. Now, the two sides here mentioned are the U.S. Mm -hmm. and Saudi Arabia. Make sure that's clear. And so, so an enduring commitment to a two-state two solution wherein a sovereign and contiguous Palestinian state lives side-by-side -side in peace and security with Israel as the only way to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in accordance with the internationally recognized parameters and the Arab Peace Initiative. And then goes on to say, the leaders noted their determination to remain closely coordinated, this again is the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. closely coordinated on efforts to encourage the parties to demonstrate through policies and actions their commitment to a two-state solution. Now, my understanding of this is Saudi Arabia, no normalization agreement unless Israel is divided. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration, the way it, where it travels into East Jerusalem on its latest trip, how it removes the Israeli flag, uh, when it travels to East Jerusalem, how it's put into place the infrastructure necessary to move the embassy from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv is also telegraphing really to the world <laughs> yeah. um, that they want to divide Jerusalem and the nation of Israel as well. And I bring this up because that's what the Bible says is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It says all nations yes. will come against Israel in an attempt to divide it. And that's Joel 3 verse 2, which mm. will finally trigger the wrath of God mm. on planet Earth. So wow. we're, we're really living, Brother Jim, in, in <laughs> times that are uh, astronomical yes in terms of Bible prophecy I mean first of all Israel exists that's a modern-day <laughs> phenomenon and secondly all of the nations are coming against Israel doing the very thing that God said they would do yeah and so I don't know what are we missing here I don't know but it just gets worse <laughs> <laughs> it does get worse let's <laughs> let's go to Roman numeral two here uh, we want to do a really fast gog Magog update, and if you really want the particulars in this Ezekiel 38 and 39 invasion, you know, here's a map that we like to use mm -hmm. of the depicting the prophecies of Ezekiel that all the nations, well, not all, but in this particular case, it mentions specific nations that are going to invade Israel in the last days. If you really want to get the particulars of this, we recommend our Middle East meltdown series mm -hmm. <coughs> that we've been doing here at Sugarland Bible Church on Sunday mornings. Which is based on a book, is it not? It's based on a book that I wrote called The Middle East Meltdown, but my book isn't the important book. <laughs> I'm just trying to write about what Ezekiel says would happen in the last days in Ezekiel 38 and 39. <coughs> so one of the invaders um, in, in this uh, end time conglomeration against Israel will be Persia. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you can see Persia there on the map uh, for a lot of reasons that we can't get into here. It's just too much information. Persia is Iran. And therefore, it's really not surprising that Iran would become very visible, um, very vocal, mm -hmm. and very sort of uh, expansionistic in the last days. Right. Um, if God means what he says and says what he means as, as preparation for this end time invasion. Right. So I just we just want to bring you up to speed, if we could, on that. Here's an article by John McCann, July 18th, 2022. This is from headlineusa.com, but this article actually 
is linked when you get into it to the Jerusalem Post. And the article says Iran claims to have nuclear bomb capability. Oh, boy. Uh, the United States stresses the commitment never to allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon and that it's prepared to use all elements of its national power to ensure that outcome. So basically, the world community is, including the United States, is committed not to have an, uh, you know, an atomic ayatollah, so to speak, not to let Iran go nuclear. And here they're boasting that they already have the capability. Yeah. Ha ha, too late. We've already got the capability. Surprise. So help us help us with that article. All right. An Iranian official has claimed that the rogue Islamic Republic is now fully capable of building a nuclear weapon. A senior advisor to the Ayatollah I, excuse me. <laughs> I blew that. Ayatollah Khomeini revealed that Tehran was only a few simple steps away from nuclear armament. Quoting now, in a few days, we were able to enrich uranium up to 60 percent, and we can easily produce 90 percent enriched uranium, he stated. Iran has the technical means to produce a nuclear bomb. It comes shortly after the country last week appeared to hint at a strategic military alliance with Russia, to whom Iran is believed to be providing drones for its war with Ukraine. So, Only time will tell mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if the Iranians are serious, wink, wink, about their capabilities. Yeah. So <clears throat> all this talk about we're going to stop Iran from going nuclear, it's, it's, all, it's too late if I'm reading this correctly. The, the capability to go nuclear is there, mm -hmm. which is scary in the hands of a Shiite theocracy regime that believes in order for the final Mahdi, I think it's the 12th Mahdi, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken yeah. on that, to come to the earth, he can only come to the earth through chaos mm -hmm. that is caused by Iran, <laughs> yeah. uh, according to the Shiite belief system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you have to create chaos in the world for this Mahdi to come. That doesn't make for a secure world to have that belief, first of all, and to secondly have the capacity to go nuclear. Imagine an <laughs> Adolf Hitler yeah. with nuclear power. It's, it's unreal. And you'll notice this line in the article, it says, it comes, this disclosure, shortly after the country last week appeared to hint at a strategic military alliance with Russia. Yeah. Now that's another player in the Gog yep. Magog invasion. Yeah. And so it stands to reason that Russia and Iran would become aggressive and expansionistic in the last days in preparation for the fulfillment of this prophecy, and the two would cooperate with each other. Yes. So how are they cooperating with each other? It says, to whom Iran is believed to be providing drones for its war with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So here is Russia invading Ukraine, and then Russia says, hey, we need some, some military drones to help us with this, and they turn to Iran. Yeah. That's, um, if that's not the outworking of a uh, stage setting of some mm -hmm. kind for Ezekiel's prophecy, I don't know what is. Uh, we'll put the QR code up again. In fact, if you go back to Pastor's Point of View 219, the one we did last week, mm -hmm. you'll see that we covered this. Yes, we uh, did. Russia, Iran. More drone, about the drones. Drone issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that takes us out of Roman numeral two. Anything you want to add to that before we go to number three here? Well, tighten your seatbelt. Yeah. That's about all I can add. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to here number three on our prophecy <laughs> update. This has to do with historical revisionism. This has to do with the blatant rewriting of history, yeah. uh, particularly here in the United States of America. Yeah. Um, I believe this issue of historical revisionism is not fully grasped and understood by most conservatives and most Christians. I agree. But it is a powerful, powerful tool that Satan is using to bring in Amen. his agenda. Amen. And just to kind of set the table for that discussion, we know that a new world order 
is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. It's predicted in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 23. Can you remind us what that passage says? Daniel 7, 23, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. So it's totalitarian Mm because it's crushing and trampling. And then it devours the whole earth. And this is according to Daniel's prophecies 2,600 years ago. This is the final form of Gentile dominion. And no one escapes. (laughs) No one escapes that will exist on the earth before the return of Jesus Christ. And so the big issue is for this to come into existence, the United States of America must uh, be rapidly reduced Mm -hmm. to equity or equality Mm -hmm. with the rest of the nations. In other words, you have to destroy a concept called American exceptionalism. Amen, that's right. Now, when we say American exceptionalism, people, you know, bristle at that. They think it's some kind of thing you're saying about racial superiority, Mm -hmm. which is not what American exceptionalism means. Exceptionalism means America is the exception to the rule. Right. As you look at most governments throughout human history, America is different. It is. Because here our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence have given more people more economic and political freedom than any other documents in human history. And I would go out on a limb, Brother Jim, and say this, other than the Bible itself, the two most important documents that have ever been written are Mm -hmm. A, America's birth certificate, Uh, the Declaration of Independence, and B, the United Mm -hmm. States Constitution, which is a description of how America is supposed to function. Mm -hmm. As long as we're functioning under the auspices of those documents, we're going to remain a free society. But that has to be destroyed, this exception to the rule, Mm -hmm. so that this new world order can come in. And one of the things that Satan does is he rewrites the history books. Yes. So you don't even know what American exceptionalism is. Um, Here is a couple of quotes showing the power of history. Uh, The first one is attributed to George Orwell, who wrote that famous book, 1984. Mm -hmm. And what does he say there about history? Yeah, maybe he needs to retitle (laughs) his book, 2022. George Orwell said the following, who controls the past controls the future who controls the present controls the past now just ruminate on that for think a about that who controls the <laughs> past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past yeah because they're the ones that write the um history books yeah the uh, rewrite rewrite the history yeah. books mm-hmm. uh now karl marx you know the the founder of communism Yes. communist thought he mm-hmm. under you know it's interesting how all of our enemies understand this very well but <sighs> but us uh conservative constitutional types mm-hmm. have a difficult mm-hmm. time catching on to this yeah. what did marx say karl marx said the following take away a nation's heritage and they are more easily persuaded yeah, uh, people who don't know their history are easily persuaded and that's why Marxism functions under what's called cultural Marxism. Mm-hmm. Is uh, you, The way to get a country to fall into communism is you have to invade the centers of thought, like the s- public school classroom, mm-hmm. like the domain of, domain of history. And you have to convince people that their country is some sort of oppressive, terrible thing. Right. Because unless you first convince them of it, they won't reach out for the so-called cure Right. Which is Marxism. Yeah. It's I've heard Bill Federer describe it this way. Let's say I'm trying to sell you toothpaste um, and you already have a brand that you're loyal to. Well, I have to tear down that brand and Mm -hmm. say it's not any good. And only if there's big doubts in your mind about the current toothpaste you're using, are you even going to be open to uh, the new brand that I want to sell you? Right. And And this historical revisionism is what is happening right now in the late great United States of America. Now, when we go to this slide here, it says, so what, points of application, Revelation 2, verse 5, when Jesus, in the book of Revelation, called the church at Ephesus to repentance, Mm -hmm. he said something very interesting. 
All right, this is a Revelation 2.5. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. So he says, remember from where you've fallen. So remembrance, you know, not having amnesia, in other words, mm-hmm. nas- in our case, national amnesia, mm-hmm. is the first step to repenting or trying to recover what you yes. once had. So if you take away the remembrance of what you once had, repentance becomes an impossibility. Yeah, it's meaningless. Mm-hmm. And so this is why Satan is rewriting history. Um in Second Kings 22, we don't have any screenshots or anything of this. There was a man named Josiah, you remember? Yes. Who discovered the law of God in the temple. Yes. And it had basically been in a place of neglect to the point where the nation didn't even know it was in there or what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Imagine con- that. This is concerning the nation of Israel. That's how fast your mm-hmm. history can disappear. Yeah. And when they brought it out and they looked at the law of God and they saw uh, their own sin in relation to God's law, there was a national uh, a revival that took place yes. in, in 2 Kings 22, 2 Kings 23. So if you don't think a nation can, can lose sight very rapidly of its history, just mm-hmm. read uh, the story of Josiah, yeah. 2 Kings 22. And 23. So this brings us into what is happening now in the American history books where our founding fathers are every bad thing they ever did. Are there bad things that they did? Of course. There's bad things that I've done. Mm -hmm. And there's bad things that you've done. Mm -hmm. And there are bad things the Apostle Paul did. You take every bad thing they did and you put it under a magnifying glass Mm -hmm. And you just exaggerate it to the point where any good they did is pushed off the table. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what's happening in something called uh, critical race theory. Yes. Sometimes this is called the 1619 Project, Mm -hmm. where America really didn't start 1776 with freedom. She started in 1619 with uh, slavery. And so the issue of slavery by our founding fathers is used over and over again to try to discredit them, to try to convince people that America is really an oppressive nation Mm -hmm. and we need to replace Mm -hmm. it all with something much more fair, like Mm -hmm. communism. And so this uh, historical revisionism is necessary to bring America down. Right. Um, You'll notice this quote here from Sonia Elks in an article that she wrote And she says, slavery is not a crime for almost half the countries of the world. Mm -hmm. In other words, these people really aren't interested in the issue of slavery. If they're interested in the issue of Mm -hmm. slavery, they wouldn't be attacking America over and over again that did something about the issue. Uh, They would be dwelling on the countries where slavery exists now, so this is an example of historical revisionism where this issue of slavery is exaggerated mm-hmm. and any good the founding fathers mm-hmm. did is is suppressed. We actually did a pastor's point of view on it. It's pastor's point of view, number 129. Uh, the title of it is Defacing the Nation yeah. w- when they were going around and tearing down all of the monuments under the auspices of critical race theory. So with that being mm. uh, with that being said, even the monuments that were typically used in our culture to commemorate our founding fathers mm-hmm. are being historically revised. Yes. So you'll notice this article from the New York Post by Mary Ling, I think is how you say that, and John Levine, July the 9th. 2022, where it says, Mont- Mont- uh, how do you say that? I think it's Monticello. Monticello is going woke and trashing Thomas Jefferson's legacy in the process. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you can't even go to a national monument anymore to commemorate Thomas Jefferson's <coughs> life <coughs> without being exposed to critical race theory and the 1619 Project. Mm-hmm. And this is this is all new. 
Yeah. Um, these are new changes being brought in at this particular time mm -hmm. to convince people that America was really founded as an oppressive nation. Yeah. And what does that article say? The hilltop mansion designed by Jefferson himself, once preserved as a tribute to the author of the Declaration of Independence, now offers visitors a harangue on the horrors of slavery. The new emphasis is the culmination of a 10-year effort to balance the historical record. Officials of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, the nonprofit that owns the estate, have said. The tour guides play besmirchment derby, never missing a chance to defame this brilliant, complex man. Stephen Owen of Enochville, North Carolina, wrote on Facebook. Last year, a Jefferson statue was unceremoniously booted from the New York City Council's chamber, where it had stood for only 187 years. Monticello's push to finish the restoration of the landscape of slavery on the estate was lar has largely been funded by, surprise, surprise, left-leaning philanthropist David M. Rubenstein, mm. who donated $20 million toward that effort in 2015. Rubenstein, a private equity billionaire and former Carter administration official, recently pledged to continue his extensive investments in China and is on the boards of the globalist World Economic Forum, China's Qingyao University, and the Council on Foreign Relations, among others. Rubenstein said in May at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. So you go to visit this Jefferson Monument Memorial, Monticello, his home, and you take a tour of it, and what you hear is how bad he was. Mm -hmm. no, nothing good. Mm -hmm. He owned slaves. Um, he was a racist. And then, you know, you pack the kids up, and you drive across the country to see this, and this is what you learn. Uh, this is a, an, an attack over and over again on Thomas Jefferson. The article says last year a Jefferson statue yeah. was unceremoniously booted from the New York City Council's chamber where it stood for 187 years. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And here's a, a screenshot from the New York Post of them you know, moving the statue yeah. out of New York City Council chambers even though it had been there for 187 years. Now, all of a sudden now, because of critical race theory <laughs> and the 1619 Project, we can't have that statue in there anymore. And I would just encourage people in this article to follow the money. Exactly. I mean, who's funding all of these changes mm -hmm. to Monticello? Mm -hmm. It mentions this guy, David Rubenstein, and then it mentions that David Rubenstein pledged to continue his extensive investments in China. Yeah. <clears throat> One of our communist foes. And is on the boards, mm -hmm. look at this, Brother Jim, of the Globalist World <laughs> Economic Forum. Yeah. And then it, at the end of the article, it says, Rubenstein said in May at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. So yeah. this guy is a one-worlder. Yeah. He's a globalist. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually globalist money that is u being used to revise our history yep. so that America and exceptionalism can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and so people think America is oppressive. And so they can bring in their experiment of, of global governance. Yeah. Can I just make a Abs quick comment absolutely. about this American exceptionalism? You were mentioning this a minute ago. And, and, and again, what is it that makes America different from every single other government that's ever been on the planet and that is that our founding fathers did not come to this uh, idea of the constitution the declaration with the idea that they were going to grant mm -hmm. freedoms and rights but rather that they were going to acknowledge where those came from mm -hmm. is that a good segue yeah yeah it's a great segue because <clears throat> from jefferson's pen came the declaration of independence <laughs> that anchors our rights in God. Mm -hmm. uh, the not law, in man. Not in man. It says the laws of nature and nature's God. 
Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Mm-hmm. The Declaration appeals to the supreme judge of the world with a fine, with a firm reliance on protection of divine providence. As mm-hmm. long as people believe this, then the World Economic Forum, uh, its global government, can't succeed. Yeah, but when we talk about historical revisionism, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. They're doing away with this. Doing away with this. The average citizen today doesn't know any of this. Yes, and that's why they're attacking Jefferson. Yes. Because what they're doing is they're taking deficiencies in his life, mm-hmm. and they're magnifying them, mm-hmm. and they're suppressing what he said here concerning mm-hmm. unalienable Amen. rights. That's why I recommend a book that's very good. I recommend the second edition. Uh, it's by David Barton, and it's called The Jefferson Lies. Mm. Now, whenever I mention David Barton, people get upset because they say, don't you know he appeared on this guy's show that was uh, that he's unorthodox? I'm not giving here a blanket endorsement of everything David right. Barton has ever written or said. Right. But <clears throat> put all that aside and read his book, The Jefferson Lies, because he brilliantly, through primary sources Mm -hmm. corrects the record concerning Thomas Jefferson. Uh, There's a number of lies that are told about Thomas Jefferson. For example, this lie of slavery. Mm -hmm. Jefferson, excuse me, Barton brings up that Jefferson was in a state where it was illegal to release the slaves. Well, gee, that that didn't show up um, in this globalist revising of history. Mm -hmm. And so Barton in this book, masterfully through primary sources, better than any book I've ever seen on the subject, sets the record straight. And this is the time period to become aware of these issues because our founding fathers are under attack because of this globalist agenda. And by the way, they're not just doing this to Thomas Jefferson. They're doing it to James Madison, Mm -hmm. um, who is called the father of the Constitution. And so here's an article from the Washington Times by Branda Hafera, June 8th, 2022. And you're going to have to help me with uh, this title. It says, The Woke Takeover of James Madison's... Mount Pelier. Mount Pelier. That's excellent pronunciation. It looks as if the American people will lose an epicenter of our nation's history. Yeah. So if you go to Monticello... Historical revisionism. Mm-hmm. If you go to Montpelier mm-hmm. to visit James Madison's memorial and home, historical revisionism as well. Right. So this is a frontal mm-hmm. assault on all of our founding fathers, funded by the globalists. Mm-hmm. And these two articles that we're quoting from deal with recent changes uh, as uh, being pushed by globalists to rewrite our history mm-hmm. at these places that were once places you could go to and get an objective, honest, good and bad intake of our founding fathers. And this is by design. Yes, it is. It's by globalist design. So what does that article say? Well, and quickly, and and isn't it interesting, these two articles we have, we have, what are our two founding documents? Mm -hmm. Our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. And who are they attacking? Yeah. All right, keep that in mind. Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, (laughs) James Madison, Father of the United States. That's exactly right. All right, here we go. In the past few months, a battle has had been waging between the Montpelier Descendant Committee and the Montpelier Foundation's Board of Directors. Recently, the board was expected to select nine of the 20 candidates put forward by the MDC. They gave the MDC member bo- members board major- majority by selecting 11 qualification for the MDC seems to be far more about political ideology than genealogy. There are currently no exhibits at Montpelier on James Madison himself. Madison's accomplishments are only discussed in a video at the Visitor Center and during a portion of the House tour. The mere distinction of color exhibit, which includes several exhibits on slavery in the cellars and the South Yard, is extensive. The story of slavery is not only being told at Montpelier, it already is the dominant narrative, according to the Montpelier rubric, 
for institutions that interpret slavery, it is not enough simply to discuss the humanity and contribution of the enslaved. It is imperative that these institutions also unpack and interrogate white privilege and supremacy and systemic racism. When touring Montpelier, visitors learn little about James Madison, the political philosopher, statesman, and founding father. There are no exhibits dedicated to his essential role in drafting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, his authorship of much of the Federalist Papers, or his seminal defense of religious freedom. So let's pack, forget about all that. Yeah, let's pack the kids in the car and let's travel across the country and let's go to Montpelier to learn about James Madison. And so you go mm -hmm. and you go to this exhibit, this monument, this place of history that's now been completely re-rised and rewritten. And you would learn yeah. about white privilege. Mm -hmm. You would be told over and over again what a terrible person this guy was because yes. he owned slaves. You would learn about how oppressive he is. And you would learn absolutely nothing about, quoting the article, when touring Mount Montpelier, visitors learn little about James Madison, the political philosopher, statesman, and founding father. This is mind-blowing here, this the, next line. It is. There are no exhibits, <clears throat> not even one, there are no exhibits dedicated to his essential role in drafting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. How, how do you leave that out when the man is the father of the constitution his authors his you would learn nothing about his authorship of the federalist papers which are <laughs> written by hamilton madison and jay to convince the new yorkers the farmers really to go ahead and adopt the constitution they're a yeah. tremendous source of light mm -hmm. into the true meaning of our constitution and you would go to this exhibit and you would never learn that this man played a role as one of the co-authors of the Federalist Papers. He was a great defender of religious freedom. You would never learn anything about yeah. that. But you would learn about critical race theory, yes. the 1619 <clears throat> Project, mm -hmm. white privilege, yep. and how oppressive America is. Systemic uh, racism. System, and you would learn about <clears throat> systemic racism. Yeah. Why? Because we have to tear America down to get you to buy into exactly. our World Economic Forum yes. uh, globalist one world Marxist right. agenda. And so to fulfill scripture, to fulfill scripture. And that's why we believe these things that we're reading about should not be understood in a vacuum, mm -hmm. but they are actually prophetically significant. Yes. Amen. So that's why we're bringing them up in a prophecy update. Yes. Now, Brother Jim, I wish we could just <laughs> hit the conclude button and, and wrap up because I think most people would that are on our side <laughs> originally would agree with what we're saying. Uh, but a lot of people are going to be greatly offended by what we're going to talk about right here because it deals with an internal criticism mm -hmm. within the body of Christ. Yes. And before we get to that, apostasy, which deals mm. with the departure from known truth amongst the professing church, mm -hmm. is mm. one of the things that will accelerate. In other words, on the eve of the rapture, uh, look for the church to not go out with a, a bang of success. Look for it to kind of run off the rails mm -hmm. in terms of departing from known truth. Mm -hmm. Paul's writings, particularly at the end of his life, are filled with these predictions. Yeah. That's why we're, we're bringing them up in a prophecy update. One of the uh, most uh, uh, central predictions Paul made in this regard is found in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. And keep in mind, he wrote this just before he died, yes. because in the same chapter, verse 16, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. Yeah. In other words, when you get ready to die, you really start to spill mm -hmm. in terms of what's important yeah. to you. Yeah. And this is what Paul predicted in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. And let's see if this sounds familiar, <laughs> right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth 
and will turn aside to myths. So this is what's going to happen within the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's writing to Timothy, a a pastor, Mm -hmm. uh, who was pastoring the church at Ephesus, a key church at the time. So this is what's going to happen towards the end of the age Mm -hmm. within the church. Now, Paul, on his third missionary journey, right at the end of it, went to a port area called Miletus, Mm -hmm. and he summoned there the elders at the church from Ephesus that he had founded, Yes, and he makes the exact same warning. And what does he say in Acts 20, verses 29 through 31 in this slide that says apostasy is internal? Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, for I know this, (laughs) that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears." So Paul is very clear in this prediction that apostasy in the last days is going to rise up from within. Yes. Wolves will come in among you also from among yourselves. Yes. Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, anybody can critique Mm -hmm. a movement outside of the church, which is heretical. That's easy. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you do something like that, the Christian church will stand up and applaud. Yeah. Where it becomes dicey and where it becomes difficult is when you see apostate moves within the church mm-hmm. and you start to critique those. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden people aren't applauding you anymore because you just toppled their personal golden calf. There you go. And uh, this, is right. a, this is the kind of situation that we have today. Mm. Uh, This is why I like to quote the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 16. This was something Paul said as the Galatian churches were becoming apostate in his day. Yeah, yeah. Galatians chapter 4, 16. And keep this in mind as we move forward to the rest of the program, folks. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? So when you critique something within, suddenly you're the enemy Mm -hmm. of people Mm -hmm. because you just toppled their golden calf. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I've given money to this particular speaker within the church. Uh, I have their books. I have their books. And look, I even have a signed autograph from them. Yeah. Um, You start to critique people within that are becoming apostate. And suddenly you move from being the fourth member of the Trinity (laughs) to the Antichrist brother-in-law in less than 24 hours. Yes. And so we just want to bring some of these things to your attention, (laughs) considering what we're getting ready to critique here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before we get to this, I think anybody that's been paying attention knows that the World Economic Forum... Mm-hmm. hosted by Klaus Schwab, is a satanic, demonic organization that is seeking to bring in the Antichrist one world government. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, here I'm quoting from an article from the Western Journal, and I'm quoting from Schwab's top advisor, Dr. Yuval Noah Harari, and... This shows you the mindset of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. Uh, This man, Harari, says, By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. So these people are about hacking people digitally, electronically, just like you would hack uh, a computer. Mm. Um, He goes on and he says, Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design, not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, Uh but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds. Mm. Didn't Satan say he wanted to be raised above the clouds? I was just thinking that very same thing. And what cloud is he speaking of here? The IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, 
these are the driving forces of um, evolution. So this is a, this is a, these are individuals that want to replace God. Mm -hmm. This is the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. He says humans are now hackable animals. The whole idea that humans have this soul or spirit, and they have free will, and nobody knows what's happening inside of me. So whatever I choose whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, that's my free will. This individual says that's over. Wow. We're going to destroy wow. human free will. <clears throat> he goes on and he says, now humans are developing even bigger powers than ever before. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation Whoa. and destruction. We are upgrading humans into gods. Whoa. This is called transhumanism. We are acquiring, for instance, the power to re-engineer life. Then he talks Ooh. about fake news. Quote, fake news has been with us for thousands of years. Just think of the Bible. Oh, my Close goodness. Close quote. And one more quote. He says, all these stories about Jesus, quote, all these stories about Jesus rising from the dead and being the son of God. This is fake news. Oh, my Close goodness. quote. Now, we all know as Christians that if you don't have the resurrection of Jesus, then our hope is in vain. First Corinthians chapter yeah. 15, verse 14 wow. says that. And this is the heart and the mindset of the World Economic Forum. It is an antichrist agenda. Mm -hmm. It is satanic and demonic at its core. Mm -hmm. And it desires to create a one world government, a new world order without God, you know, erase borders, transhumanism, social credit system, uh, one world surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what this World Economic Forum is all about. And they're telling us. <laughs> they're telling Once us. again. Uh, m much like uh, Hitler told us what he was going to do ahead of time. Yeah. In his uh, book, uh, uh, mein Writings, Kampf. Mein, mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan comes as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. What Satan loves to do is he likes to take Christians and Christianity as useful idiots. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a pejorative, a useful idiot. Right. Stalin, Lenin, they all use the expression. Right. You co-op people that don't fully understand your agenda mm -hmm. to espouse your agenda. Right. And then once you accomplish your agenda you get rid of the useful idiots right away. Mm -hmm. Satan loves to take Christian useful idiots mm -hmm. to put a happy face yeah, here we go. on this one world agenda. Mm -hmm. And all of that is background to Billy Graham's daughter, mm -hmm. Anne Graham Lotz, who was, I think, undiscerningly co-opted at the initial stages of the World Economic Forum to be a useful idiot. Mm -hmm. In fact, on her blog, it's entitled Anne Graham Lott's blog post, May the uh, 2nd, 2011. This is what she says about the World Economic Forum. And what does she say there? Approximately 2,000 world leaders gathered in a small Swiss skiing village for their annual meeting at the end of January to network and help guide the world to a better place. I was very encouraged to discover that the founder and director, Professor Klaus Schwab, publicly acknowledged that answers to the problems the world is facing politically and economically will come from what he describes as the faith community. While I know at Davos the faith community includes Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists, Professor Schwab went out of his way to draw in evangelical Christians such as myself and to make us feel welcome. And I saw Jesus in righteousness and justice shaking the world's business and economic leaders by exposing the greed and self-serving interests that have dominated policies for decades. So she was intentionally targeted by Klaus Schwab to be brought to Davos in 2011 as a member of the faith community, by the way, along with Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists, mm -hmm. 
to basically put a happy face, a spiritual face on this very dark agenda. And she says here, and I saw the righteousness and, and justice shaking the world's business and economic leaders by exposing the greed and self-serving interests that have dominated policies for decades. She saw Jesus there. Yeah. Now, what I would submit is she saw the rider on the white horse, mm. but not the one in Revelation 19. Mm. She saw the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6, mm -hmm. verses 1 and 2, yeah. the Antichrist mm -hmm. masquerading as the true Jesus Christ. She was obviously mm -hmm. co-opted and brought into this back in 2011 because of her father's name. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is Billy Graham's daughter that we're speaking of here. And she has been ever since a supporter of the World Economic Forum. Now people mm -hmm. are saying, well, this is a 2011 article. Well, I'm going to give you some sources to go to in just a moment. But when you go to those sources, what you're going to discover is she was a delegate to the World Economic Forum as late as 2020. So you can't dismiss this as, oh, this is dated material. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been her consistent position, you know, advocating for the World Economic Forum. Yeah, and the only other thing I want to quickly add is in this same blog, she talks about shared values. I thought we were supposed to come out from among them and be separate. Exactly. And... Well. One of her defenses is, well, I just went there to evangelize. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what this says. No. The, she is not evangelizing. She is giving a blanket endorsement mm -hmm. to Schwab mm -hmm. and an antichrist agenda. Now, whether she fully understands what how she's been fooled here mm -hmm. as a useful idiot mm -hmm. or not is immaterial. That's who she is lending you know, mm -hmm. her voice too. Mm -hmm. Now we have a couple of, you, I think we have a QR, a couple of QR codes we're going to put up because what has happened in the last 24 hours is she has gotten a lot of pushback mm -hmm. for this statement. And so somebody went into her website blog post and removed that paragraph. They redacted. Redacted it. In fact, I was working on this Thursday night and this paragraph, maybe it was Wednesday night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this paragraph was there. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to work on it the next day, this paragraph was taken away. Mm -hmm. So what we're quoting here is not the blog. You have to look at her newsletter. Yeah. Because you can't change a newsletter. Right. And she still, last time I checked, has the newsletter posted. And this paragraph is in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. Now, this first came out through my friend Brandon House. And here's a QR code to frankspeech.com where he interviewed me and the two of us dealt with this issue. Mm -hmm. And he provides the screenshots mm. of the blog post uh, before they went in and, as you say, self-censored or yes. redacted it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second QR code to a to worldviewweekend.com where we discuss this, the two of us, july the 15th so if you're wondering gosh uh, you're quoting this article and i'm not sure she really said it she did say it yeah it shows up in her newsletter number one and number two it's in her blog post in the brandon house frank speech video and worldview weekend radio interviews which he had uh, providentially the, done video the original the original mm -hmm. uh, normally we do those audio but this mm -hmm. time he did it video wow um, and you can actually see the screenshots themselves so what Ann Graham Lotz is doing here is she's not repenting mm -hmm. she is hiding mm -hmm. uh, she's kind of doing this bob and weave and she's trying to make it sound like uh, she really didn't say what clearly she said and mm -hmm. she doesn't want the Christian world to understand you know, exactly what it is she was advocating for in 2011. And right up to 2020, mm -hmm. she was actually a delegate to the World Economic Forum wow. in Davos, Switzerland. Wow. Now, with all of that being said, we did get an email response from either her or one of her surrogates. And what does that say? You can just read this first paragraph here if you don't mind. After your show Friday, I sent an email to A.G. Lotz about the WEF. 
This is just in case you're interested in her response. On behalf of lots, Mary Fuller Sessoms sent this. We pray you will be encouraged by Ann's words. So somebody heard the show that Brandon and myself did, and they sent an email to Ann Graham Lotz, and this was her response. Mm -hmm. Quote, quoting the email. Here it goes. I was invited by Klaus Schwab at the recommendation of Lord Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, to attend the WEF twice, once in 2006 and once in 2011. In 2006, there were several other Christian leaders invited as religious VIPs. Among them were Rick Warren, Jim Wallace, and Richard Land. Lord Carey had wanted me to attend simply to promote the gospel in forums, dinners, and discussions, which I tried to do. I hope this answers the concern. I am in no way a secular progressive globalist, but I am a servant of Jesus Christ who will go wherever he sends, even to the WEF. Okay, now she's promoting this as I just went there to evangelize. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm not a secular progressive globalist. I believe her. I believe she's not a secular globalist progressive. But due to her naivety... She has been used as a useful idiot Mm -hmm. to put a Christian spiritual Mm -hmm. veneer over a very dark and uh, demonic agenda. And in fact, her response in this email actually makes the problem worse, in Mm -hmm. my opinion, because she goes, she says, I went there because I was invited. And after all, other people were going like Rick Warren. Mm hmm. As if Rick Warren is our yeah. standard. Yeah, we yeah we want to rely on him. And then she says other people were going like Jim Wallace. Oh, she uses boy. the word Jim Wallace. Now, yeah. folks, what what do we know about Ooh. Jim Wallace? Jim Wallace, it's been exposed over and over again, is a liberation theologian. Yeah. Basically, what he is is a Marxist mm-hmm. with kind of Bible verses tossed in mm-hmm. to justify Marxism. And the fact that she was invited by those two guys... Uh, makes her more, in my mind, accountable Mm -hmm. because those two guys, their involvement in anything. Well, she calls them (laughs) VIPs, too. (laughs) VIPs. Those two guys, more than anyone I can think of, should tell you that you're, you know, barking up the wrong tree. Anything they're involved in, you should not want to be involved involved in. You don't want to be associated. And she makes this case that I just went there to evangelize, but in her blog article, that's not what she says. She doesn't say, I I went there to evangelize. What she is doing is she's putting a happy face, a Jesus face, Mm -hmm. over the whole thing, Mm -hmm. and she's giving it a blanket endorsement. Yeah, she is. Um, And if she went there just to evangelize, why not just say that in your blog post? Mm -hmm. But she doesn't say that. What she's saying is, I'm endorsing, you know, the whole... The whole thing. So what has happened? She saw Jesus. She saw Jesus there. And really what she saw there was the Antichrist. Mm. Um, What has been happening over the last 24 hours with her ministry? And this is very embarrassing for her. It's very embarrassing for all these other ministries that have platformed her. Mm -hmm. For example, Brother Jim, there are major uh, prophecy ministries. Mm Mm-hmm whose whole ministry is exposing the New World Order, Mm -hmm. who continually bring her on as a guest. Yeah. Now, how do you bring her on as a guest when it's revealed that she was used as an useful idiot to put a happy face, a Bible face, a spiritual face over the whole WEF Mm -hmm. Klaus Schwab agenda? So she looks bad. Um, All of these ministries that have platformed her they look bad. So what's happened over the last 24 hours is damage control. Yeah. You know, if she just came out and said, you know what? I goofed. I didn't fully understand what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, Does she not understand that her respect in the body of Christ would grow exponentially? Yeah. And she would receive nothing but grace. Right. But people, when they're caught, as, as Paul said, Mm -hmm. have I become uh, your enemy for telling you the truth? Uh, people that are caught, what they do is they camouflage and mm-hmm. they self-edit mm-hmm. and they censor and they don't want anybody else to know what they've done or what they've said. They deflect. And the truth of the matter is um, Satan loves to take gullible 
uh, naive, undiscerning Christians, particularly those with a big name. Yeah. And he wants to use them to scripturalize, biblicize in some way a satanic agenda Mm -hmm. because Satan comes as an angel of light and he knows not everybody is going to accept this agenda unless we get some useful idiots Mm -hmm. within the Christian community promoting it. Good point. That's why we have this uh, picture here of the United Nations in New York City. And you'll notice the square at the bottom on United Nations property it has scripture verses from the book of Isaiah yeah. about how we're mm-hmm. going to beat their swords into plowshares. Mm-hmm. Now, we understand that as a messianic prophecy that mm-hmm. won't be fulfilled until Jesus returns. But the United Nations, by putting this, inscribing it on their property, is essentially assuming upon its own shoulders a messianic role. And they're using distorted scripture to promote what I think is a very evil New World Order globalist agenda. And Anne Graham Lotz got used yeah. in that regard. I, I was just thinking, you know, they, they, they haven't limited uh, claiming creative abilities now. We just read about that, yes. right? So now they're also claiming messianic issues, applying sure. them to themselves. What's, yeah. what's left? Wants to be God, wants to be the Messiah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Folks... The United <laughs> Nations is not going to bring this prophecy in Isaiah no, 2 no. and Isaiah 11 into existence. In fact, there have been more wars since the foundation of the United, uh, United Nations than mm-hmm. before. Um, well, what they're going to bring is tribulation. But the, Exactly. But they're claiming this godlike status. And who better to cover the issue up than an unsuspecting... Christian with yeah. a big name like Billy Graham yeah. and his daughter putting kind of a scriptural face and a happy face on it. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to do a prophecy update on apostasy, uh, internal apostate movements within the church without bringing this to people's attention. Yeah. And the fact that this kind of thing is occurring is also a sign of the times. Would, you, would you not agree with I that? I do agree with that. Mm-hmm. So, with all of that being said, um, there's a mindset out there called rent an evangelical. <laughs> I mean, Google it, you'll see people using that. Oh, my goodness. We want to use evangelicals with big names to kind of, along with the Buddhists and the Hindus and everybody else that she mentions, to promote satanic agendas. Wow. Rent an evangelical. Wow. And Graham Lotz got taken to the cleaner. Wow. So, now, does this mean I, I reject everything Anne Graham Lotz says? No. I, I happen to personally like her. Mm-hmm. I've listened to some of her uh, talks. Some of them have been very edifying. And just because you disagree with some, somebody on a point doesn't mean you're disagreeing with everything they've ever said. <laughs> right. But we are publicly disagreeing with her on a point, and we are calling her here on Pastor's Point of View to public repentance. Yeah. Come out and say you were wrong. Mm -hmm. Distance yourself from this. Don't self-censor and hide. Yes. And all of the other ministries that have been platforming her, you come out and repent publicly as well. Yeah. Um, And by the way, if Brother Jim and Andy Woods make a similar blunder, I hope you would love us enough to call us to public repentance as well. They do. Now, <laughs> we don't have the name behind us like <laughs> Billy Graham, so our opinion probably is of less you know, value in terms of globalists wanting our perspective. But you have to understand, if you're an evangelical and you have a big name, you've got a big target on your back by people that don't have your best interest, yeah. and they're trying to co-opt you yep. for their own agenda. Yep. What did Paul say in... 2 Corinthians 2, mm-hmm. verse 11, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. There you go. I would say that today, with how Satan is working with this World Economic Forum and how he's bringing Christians on board, we're totally ignorant of mm-hmm. Satan's devices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, Brother Jim, mm. do you have any good news for us? <laughs> well, let's see if we can find some, right? How about Titus 2.13? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. As we look at all these things happening, they should just cause us to rejoice because we know that God is bringing everything right into focus where it's supposed to be. Yeah, things related to Israel. 
things related to Gog Magog, things related to historical revisionism, mm-hmm. and things even related to apostasy within the church. Yes. And yet through it all, our mm-hmm. hope is Jesus is going to soon return Amen. and take us out of this this world. And if people out there don't know Jesus personally, how would you, what would you say to them? Well, we talked about repentance here a little bit. Let's talk about that with regards to salvation. First of all, you have to understand that there's a problem. All right. The problem is you have a sin nature and you inherited that from Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that separated you for all eternity from God. But God, because he loves you so much has made a provision whereby if you will meet one condition, just one, you can once again, or you can become a child of God and you can have a home in heaven and spend all eternity with Christ Jesus. And what is the one condition for salvation? It is faith. It is trust. It is placing your confidence in what Jesus did on the cross for you for the safekeeping of your soul it doesn't require any special effort on your part god doesn't say believe and Mm -hmm. he doesn't say you know uh you have to give money you have to go to church you have to clean up your life and once you do all those things then you can be saved no 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 he says believe only that's the simple one and only condition so it's a, private, it's a private matter between you and the Lord. You can just trust Christ in your heart right now as we're speaking. And the Bible says in the instance, in fact, instance isn't fast enough. Mm-hmm. In, in the micromillimeter of time that you say, I'm placing my tr- trust and faith in Jesus Christ for the safekeeping of my soul. Guess what? It's done. And it's an eternal covenant that can never be broken. So are you concerned about what's happening in the world today, especially as we've uh, you know, elucidated some of that here? Let me just tell you right now, you are no longer subject to what's going to be coming because the Bible says that as a child of God, you, you have something very exciting to look forward to. And that's either the rapture, which could happen at any moment, Mm -hmm. or at the point of death to be instantly in the presence of God the Father for all eternity. Very well said. So what are you waiting for? Very well said. The best news God ever gave me. Yes. Just by way of infomercials, follow us on Pastor's Point of View on podcast format. Also look for us. Just type in Andy Woods Ministries into your YouTube search engine. And we also have um, a Rumble account. Type in Andy Woods Ministries into Rumble. We've got some big announcements to make in the subsequent weeks related to new platforms. Um, I'll just kind of pique your interest now without going into the information because uh, we're not completely ready yet. But there's going to be some good changes coming. To pastor's point of view, mm-hmm. we think you'll be very happy with the changes, very positive changes. And beyond that, if you want these show notes that I come up with, but Pastor Jim works so hard to edit and make look presentable, just sign up at andywoodsministries.org. On the homepage, there's a way to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and you'll receive these show notes in your inbox whenever we post a pastor's point of view show Uh, this show is going to be posted today eminently momentarily and accompanying that will come these these show notes later on today into Mm -hmm. your inbox all you got to do is sign up to receive the newsletter and you can research these articles yourself and be a good berean and see if the things that we are saying are actually so Absolutely. And with that being said, we will close off for today. Oh, by the way, Amazon Smile, you can make us smile uh, <laughs> by just uh, putting Andy Woods Ministries into Am- you know to your Amazon Smile. That that means every time you purchase something on Amazon, uh, we get a little bit of the proceeds. So that that makes the Lord smile. Amen. Yes. There's a lot of transactions going on on Amazon there are. today, so why not use some of that to expand God's purposes on the earth? Well, with that, we're just going to wrap up. Yes. We love you. Good Thank stuff. you for watching. We'll see you next week, and God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless.